So let's move on to our next speaker, another John, John McGee. How's it going? Thanks very much. Just uh, I'd like to welcome many members of OSA that might be in the crowd. And also a little bit of fuck you. Fuck you, Terry. Right, I'm just going to give you um, an insight into the... the uh, of a, of a public Scientologist because I don't have any horror stories, just rather tales of financial extortion and discomfort, really. So, uh, I wasn't dragged in off the street or recruited, I actually went in to my local mission out of curiosity because I knew it was something I was going to do. Somewhere along the line, I am. Um, yeah, okay. Speak up. All right. I knew it was something I was going to do somewhere along the line because I was very curious as to world religions and different spiritual paths, so Scientology was a port of call, it was a box to tick. So I went in for the personality test and I read them as to what course I wanted to do. I told them I wanted to do this, 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 they actually, I, they, they suggested certain courses for me I didn't want to do them, I, I told them the ones I wanted to do in particular, but anyway I followed their advice, their guidance, which I, I thought was good at the time. But to my surprise, the people who agreed to me were surprisingly normal. Well, apparently normal. You know, the course supervisor was the, like, she was like a mixture between a librarian and a vicar's wife. And you, <laughs> you get the auditor who looked much like a minister himself in how he dresses and his, uh, his attitude. And uh, I didn't really mind the pay-as-you-go system because I figured that uh, if you were paying for something, you might actually get something in return. That wasn't the case in the end, but <laughs> I knew there wasn't, uh, there was something not quite right. I knew that from the get-go, but I was willing to turn a blind eye if it delivered what it had promised initially. And the courses were, um, they were relatively inexpensive to begin with. So, you know, you're talking 30 euro, 40 euro for your first courses, but you know, every, with every course, it, uh, it would add on an extra 20, 30, you know? So before you know it, you're on the purification, which you're talking a couple of grand, was it, at the time? And uh, I think 30 days in the sauna for a person who never did drugs before to get drug residues out of your body. I don't know how they, they uh, reasoned that one, but whenever I did 30 days in the sauna, finishing up on 500 milligrams a day of niacin, when I was like sick. But anyway, I got through it. Purification I did in partnership with an absolute weirdo who wrote a KR on me for wearing Speedos and so on. I mean, what the fuck was I supposed to wear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, uh, he did a KR on me, and uh, I, never, I had to spend 30 days with that fucker. And, you know, <laughs> we were never the same after it, you know? Uh, it was intense regging all of the time. Uh, I don't know, the IAS regs, there was this horrible creature of a woman from the Sea Org called Ginger Smith. Some of you may have known her. Yeah. She'd stand up here and they'd put on the theme to, it'd be in a room much the same as this with many people, and she'd put on the theme to Mission Impossible, wasn't it? And she'd do a little dance. Oh, she's a disgusting creature. Despicable. <laughs> but, um, and uh, she'd keep you in until she'd write a figure on the whiteboard and until you reach that target, you weren't getting out. Even our auditor used to man the door, and at one stage there was a, a Hungarian public Scientologist there, and he wanted to leave. And the auditor, Des Sinnott, if you will, um, in case you're watching this, or your family are watching this on YouTube later on, you know, the name and shame you. He used to guard the door and he would tell the guy, unless you're very good at wrestling, you're not going to get past me. Wow. You now you, know, you put this guy through the fucking wall with a feather, you know, but it's amazing the power he had over you with his tech, because being the auditor, he was viewed as a, an oracle of sorts. So uh, it's pretty pathetic to see that and the power he would have over, over his uh, minions. So, um, if you didn't have money for course, or if you told them you didn't have money for a course, they would ask, ask you to prove that. And at one stage I was escorted to uh, an ATM by a female member of staff. I was just playing along, I didn't think she was serious. So it was all the O'Brien Carolyn, if you ever see this, shame on you. <laughs> so, so I took her to an ATM and I took out a card uh, of an account I knew I didn't have much money on, so I showed her, you see, I don't have that 500 quid you were looking for, you know? So, um, 
I got over that one, but she got me further down the line. You know, they got a few grand off me since that. Um, the ethics officer, that's another story. Why do they give them, exalt themselves and give them such, themselves such high titles? Because they mean absolutely nothing in the outside world. Our ethics officer in Dublin Mission, Sabrina Collins, a woman who doesn't have much ethics herself, um, was trying to register me for staff one of the days, and I told her, you know, uh, my family are more important than Scientology, so I don't, I'm not willing to spend 15, 16 hours a day in there like you. And she just told me that, well, her six-year-old daughter at the time was not as important to her as Scientology was. Oh, wow. And then she was uh, expecting any person she read for staff to be of the same attitude, of the same ilk. Anyway, I, I pacified her by signing the two and a half year contract. It was two and a half year staff contract, but I never showed up. I didn't do fuck all with that, you know. But, um, you know our auditor at the time, Des Sinnott, He's still there. He's up to you. He wasn't even clear at the time, but yet he was getting people clear. He said he clear wasn't on his attention at the time. He's, I think he's up to five now, something like that. He was absolutely sexually obsessed. You know, he would try and get as many sexual deviant, sexually deviant acts out of you in in his all of his sessions as as he could. He, he was something like a pervert priest who was storing all these mental images in his wine bank for later on, you know. <laughs> but, uh, absolute, absolute sick creature, sick creature. He physically imitated handicapped people and like the impersonation, impersonation like that from across the audience table telling me word for word, now I quote, I don't feel one bit sorry for these fuckers. They deserve everything they get because of past life transgressions. So. He's the one guy that we cannot seem to get on camera when we're raiding outside of the mission. But we'll get you yet, Des, you know? Make you famous in the worst possible way. So, another one of his, uh, he just had no compassion and he was too good for everybody. Because he was an auditor, he was too good for everybody on staff. He looked down upon them. He wouldn't date any of them because they weren't as high ethically as him. Um, I mean, some of them were higher on the bridge, but he thought he was greater than those. So much so that he would, you know, you would suggest, say, a date to him, you know, as a, a female date, and he would say, no, she's not hot enough for me, quote, a quote, she's not hot enough. I deserve the best because of the ethical person I am. I think the guy's still single anyway. Was, uh, so uh, I noticed a lot of empty promises and tall tales when I was, uh, during my tenure in Scientology. Um, you know, a friend of mine lost absolutely everything. He's in financial exile in, in another country now because he maxed out his credit card, has burnt his bridges with the bank. Um, the ethics officer's wife, who was the sorry, the ethics officer's husband, who was the mission holder there at the time, I think he still is, Jerry Collins. He promised this guy that if he parted with all of his money and remortgaged his home, sold everything he had to pay for his bridge up to clear, that he would be so empowered that he would make all this money back again. But that didn't happen. He lost absolutely everything. And my friend went into the mission holder and told him what had happened. And he had no sympathy or compassion whatsoever. He told him, you got yourself into this, you can get yourself out of it. And that was, that was the end of him. The end of told you. Um, some more of the tall tales included one of the public, who's still a public there, who parted with everything and is back living at his parents' house at nearly 40 years of age because he sold everything to give to Scientology. He, he buys this whole reincarnation bollocks. Uh, he said that he was James Dean in a past life. <laughs> uh, this guy is an inspiring actor, actually. He wants to be. And he also told his non-Scientologist sister that he and she had been lovers in a past life. I, don't, I really don't know how the sister took this at all. I tell you, most people would be too comfortable with it. Yeah. Our ethics officer told one of the exes that can't be with us here tonight, Gabrielle Wynn. A lot of you know her because she's be a friend of yours on, on Facebook. But they told, uh, she told her that SPs get their dogs to defecate into their mouths. Um, you know, I just don't know where this is coming from. It's absolutely bizarre. But um, most of them double up as Scientologists, double up as conspiracy theorists. So the only non Hubbard publications they're permitted to read would be the likes of David Icke or To Rule by Secrecy, those type of books written by other nutbars. <laughs> so they would also tell you that 
the vitamin companies would deliberately, I don't know, uh, put insufficient amount, insufficient amounts of the vitamin in the pills just to make society sick, so that you're to double up on every <laughs> vitamins you take, you know, which would probably be detrimental to your health in, in in time. But that's the theory they had. Or it could be also another reason to push you towards buying your vitamins from G and G or other Scientology-owned vitamin companies. And I'm sure maybe that's the case. They uh, seem to have no political. When I was there, they had no political affiliations whatsoever because they believed that Scientology was the only way of governing the world and ridding society of its of its ills. Uh, the front groups that you will encounter as a public Scientologist, because as a public Scientologist, you get a very glossy view of what Scientology is. You don't see the, the heartache that goes on in the sea, or you know you're greeted with fake smiles and hugs and what have you, and go for coffee and all, and all the whole other shallow bullshit. But you don't see people on the RPF, you don't see people suffering, you don't see their families torn apart. You get a very idealistic view, a utopian view of what Scientology is, and it all seems very nice on the surface. Um, so their front groups you would, would be chiropractic clinics and vitamin companies, but there was uh, two chiropractors in, in my country, in, in Dublin, that used to set up stalls in shopping malls, it's like chiropractic booths, and they would do spinal adjustments on people. I mean, the people manning these stalls, they were not qualified in absolutely anything other than a few miserable courses in Scientology. But this would be a way of hawking Scientology material onto unsuspecting public and eventually they get them onto course. Because one of my course twins at one stage, um, I asked her how she became interested in Scientology and she told me, oh, by Dr. Darren, which was a public Scientologist there. My guy's a chiropractor, so therefore he's not a real doctor, so I don't know why they insist on using these titles. Um, there are two members of staff at our mission who are involved in fitness instruction and Zumba. And last year, myself and Pete Griffiths actually attended one of their events just to see what they were doing, and they had unsuspecting public, mostly fitness fanatics, partaking in this Zumba fan, they called it. And they were they had a bookstall set up, and everybody there was a Scientologist. Everybody manning it or had anything to do with the in charge of the project was, was a Scientologist, but the people attending did not realize this. I don't think they sold many books. I think we made sure of that. But, um, <laughs> but afterwards, uh, we followed one of the mission staff back to the mission, and I was, I was wanting to speak to him, so I approached him. And he turns around, I think, I don't know what they're telling them these days that they have these special powers, but I followed the guy and I called his name, Vincent, Vincent, I want to talk to you. And he turns around to me like, I was here? He turns around to me like, oh. like that. Like General Zod, I think he expected <laughs> laser beams to shoot out of his eyes and maybe struck down, but it didn't happen. So I really don't, that shit is madness because I was, I understood that I was privy to OT, uh, Scientologists, this guy isn't even clear. So they must be upgrading the Scientologists fast because they're, they're in it. <laughs> They're in battle now against us, I suppose. But uh, those are just some of the tales that I, I experienced as a public Scientologist. I'm not going to go on and on about this because there's more serious matters at hand. But uh, I would like to thank the organisers on this side of the pond, Xander and, and John Sawyer, for, for this. It's, um, it's great to have their help. We wouldn't be able to do it without them. So that's it. Thank you.